on to our next guest speaker, and I'm delighted to introduce to you uh, Mr. Ron Suba. So Ron is the President Emeritus of Prosper Marketplace and Chairman of the Board at Credible. He brings more than 20 years of experience in the finance industry, spanning Wall Street to fintech as a proven leader and innovator. He's been a pioneer in the peer-to-peer -peer lending sector. He's globally sought after for his expertise in business strategy, in marketing, and product and business development in fintech and financial services. His curriculum vitae goes on and on and on, but the best way I can describe Ron Suber is just go Google who's the mayor or who's the godfather of fintech and Ron Suber will appear. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ron Suber. Green button. Good morning. So today and tomorrow you're going to hear from insurance companies and accounting firms and banks and people that work here in the US and in Canada and in Asia and in Australia. What I want to try to do is something a little different. I want to try to zoom back for each of you and quickly talk about where we were, kind of where we are, and what is this golden era, this golden age of fintech. I have sold companies to banks, had banks buy equity and debt in my companies. I understand the issues. I was in Boston and Delaware, New York, and Philadelphia just weeks ago talking to the banks and the regulators and academics about what's happening. And I'd like to share some of that with you today, because today you're either as excited as you ever were about fintech and financial services, or you are as scared as you've ever been. It's changing at machine speed and not brain speed. And we don't have years and months to get this right, because in a year or two, the winners will be decided. And let's go through that. So when I travel, just back from South America, just back from Asia, heading to Australia Monday, and then on to Japan, I get to meet with the payments companies, often powering the banks and investing in them, like Avid Exchange and others, and point to sale companies changing that experience that not just the Gen I, the people who've always had an iPhone or the internet or millennials or us, the Gen Xers and olders, people that want it faster, different, and better. People looking for sustainability and financial inclusion and a big difference to the way lines of credits are done and consumer loans are done and invoice finance, such a broken part of the way money is moved and transferred. I'm advising nine companies today, and I'm the chairman of the board of one company, which is the biggest fintech IPO in Australia. And so I really get to meet with the entrepreneurs, the tech people, to talk about their issues. If we zoom back for a second, how did this all get started? This is what a typical cycle looks like. Each cycle for innovation and velocity takes about 50 years. And the shape looks something like this. There's the first 15 years, the golden era in the middle, which we're in today. And then that last period where innovation flattens out and the winners dominate and rule. It happened in radio. It happened in TV. It's happening today in computers. But really, it's all about mobile. How many of you have a computer desktop at home that really just holds a shirt or something? Because you're using your iPhone or your iPad or your Samsung device. Well, this is where it all really started in FinTech back here in the 91, 96 era where we started to trade securities, options, and futures, and bonds online instead of going to see somebody or call somebody. How many people remember typing in rotary phones and push button phones to buy and sell and look at your account balances? E-Trade changed that, and eLoan changed it, doing the first mortgage online. The guy who started eLoan also started Prosper and also started Ripple. So he, Chris Larson, really, to me, is the godfather of FinTech for what he's done. And then what happened, PayPal changed the way we pay for things and transfer money in 1998. Look at what PayPal's done today. It's literally mind-blowing where they're going. They will be a bank. They will be so many more things in this golden era. To me, they're one of the big winners. And then in 2008 and 2009, Prosper came and Lending Club came. They made online lending and investing. They democratized credit. And they changed the way we borrow and lend forever. And now you see tons of companies around the world, Green Sky and others, doing lending in a very, very different way. Think about this era or these people like you might think about eBay or AOL. They actually gave you a reason to go to the internet. 
to share information, to do things, or to buy and sell things? Well, these companies, Prosper and Lending Club and others, 10 years ago, gave people that reason to go to the internet to borrow and lend in a very different way. So in transactions, this is generation one. Probably the winners are here as well that made it to the golden era. This is generation two in lending. And we're going to see if these are the winners long term. You have Goldman Sachs creating Marcus Bank and these other challenger banks that may disrupt the early Gen 2 lending companies. And time will tell. But this is where we are in this golden age. Watch these companies. How many people here use or have WeChat on their phone today? Can I just see a quick show of hands? OK, so 2 billion people on this planet have it. And seven people in this room have it. Watch this thing. This is, in Asia, what Amazon and Facebook and all these other things are together. It is an amazing way that transactions are done. It is Uber. It combines all of that. And that's where we're going to some of that functionality in banking, in financial services, like a WeChat type thing. Texting, it's over. WhatsApp, it's trying to catch WeChat. Watch this. This is one of the golden era winners. So it used to be that the incumbents had all the information, right? You had to go to a bank or insurance company, a telecom company, or an auto company to do what they do. But not anymore, because we're in this golden era, and it's all changed. That these incumbents used to just compete with each other. And now they're competing with big tech and fintech and other innovators. I agree with Amy that banks are innovative. She said it, not me, that they might have gotten lazy. What I try to tell the banks is it's the agility and it's the data and the use of the data. So the banks have the data, but it's in four different databases. And there isn't the agility sometimes to use that data the way the fintechs and other innovators around the world are doing because of the way the data is done. And that's what's so exciting about what Oracle's doing is helping make that data more useful, more innovative, more agile. So this group on the right is absolutely going after the banks. Roll back for a second. Nobody understood why PayPal bought Venmo and Zoom. Everyone thought they overpaid for it. But they were steps and steps ahead, understanding this is where the people were going. They wanted a different way, different experience. The same with Google. When they bought YouTube, they were laughed at. And Waze, this crowdfunding driving thing, what does Google want to do with that? What did Google buy here in New York a couple months ago for over a billion dollars that blew people's mind? The Chelsea Piers. Why is Google buying this pier, this piece of real estate in New York? Go there, and you'll see, because that's where the people are. And that's why Amazon bought Whole Foods, because they want to go where the people are. And so in the future, we'll put Chelsea Piers and other things on here that these big techs are buying and getting into because they want to make sure they continue to capture your hearts and your minds and your wallets and your future financial transactions. Facebook was losing people to Instagram. They bought it. I put this up here over the weekend. It's a blotch, right? It can happen. Big data, big tech, big companies can run into problems about data and transparency and now regulation like many of you at big tech and big banks have had. And so this is going to be a very interesting time to see what happens to these big tech companies. Do they get slowed by regulation and from perhaps misusing that valuable asset? Not oil, not gold, but data. So banks used to compete with banks. Now they're competing with this new group. How many people have tracked what Goldman Sachs has done with this brand new bank called Marcus? Can I see a show of hands? How many people know what this is? Watch this. After you look at WeChat, look at Marcus. They took $250 million and two years and built the future online lending company. They started in consumer. They just bought a company to get into real estate. They just bought a credit card company. They just bought a PFM. Now they're in home improvement. This is an enormous competitor. Wall Street is coming to your world, to the banking world, with low cost of capital, but new technology, new data, and building this brand experience. And they're raising the rate for cash and raising your cost of capital as banks. So really watch what they're doing to make sure you understand where they're going so you don't end up in a year and a half someplace that they're already past. These are other big, big winners. Try to understand what's happening with these companies. 
Coinbase went from 200 million to 1.9 billion to now $12 billion. This is the exchange, the custodian, the counterparty for all of this crypto stuff, which I'll talk about in a minute. And Grab, what's happening with Grab and financial services and transportation, gonna be bigger than Uber. Amazon, Stripe, Square, and this thing called WeChat. Companies that most of the kids know about. So every time I hear somebody talk about Bitcoin or XRP or something, some coin, the price of the coin, it drives me crazy. Because that's not what we should be focusing on at all. Here's an example to try to tell that story, the internet. When the internet first came out, people's like, what is it? What's dot com? What are the applications? What's the big deal? Well, email was the first app on the web. And people said, that's it? Email? Whatever? But they didn't realize from the web came Amazon and Facebook and Google and all of this payments information, the way we shop, the way we travel. And that's the analogy I want to try to draw to blockchain. Blockchain is the web. It's the new, trusted, and transparent way things will move. The coin, all these coins you hear about, is just the first app on the chain, like email was to the internet. And so what's coming from the chain is not the coin, but all of these other things, all of these other ledgers. It's real. Don't follow the coin. We've gone up through the hype cycle. It's coming all the way back down. It is what's going to happen next, where you're going to see this trust and transparent, this new way moving everything you do in your life. And I'll give you a couple examples in just a second. So the pressure is on big time, and it's coming at machine speed. And you see big banks investing in fintechs, in the debt, in the equity, buying the whole companies, integrating this new group into how the banks work. And I totally applaud KeyBank and everybody for doing what they're doing. And it's not slowing down at all. It's happening over each of these different sectors to try to capture what's happening next. And it's happening in payments and regulatory and data and all kind of things. And this is where Oracle can help tie so much of this together once these acquisitions happen. So the big bang is right now. It's actually yesterday, not tomorrow. One of the biggest things that I saw was this thing called N26. Anybody know what N26 is? Should quick show of hands. The biggest European, seven hands, the biggest European asset manager, insurer, old, stodgy, huge company, teamed up with the biggest, most agile, innovative, wealthy, most valued Chinese company to create this brand new bank. And they started it off with just $160 million. This will be a $50 billion company, like Ant Financial, like Alibaba. Watch this thing. And a shot across the bow happened last month when two regional banks bought into an online lender and student lending because this presidential administration doesn't want the government in student loans anymore. And so you will see the banks have this opportunity to do funding for student lending again. Watch this move. This is an indication of what's coming. And then you have old companies buying AI companies trying to get in front of all this too. The pressure is coming from this evolving customer, us getting smarter, wanting a different experience, different engagement, and this new generation, the way they want things, it's totally different. Capital markets are changing. We're in this access economy where money can find itself in a brand new way without having to go to some of the incumbents. Government participation, sometimes it's leaning in, sometimes it's leaning out, but it's global. What's happening in Singapore is the model for government participation in banking, in fintech, and in innovation. It is a globalized world, there's no doubt about it. Mobile, 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 forget this desktop thing. It's all going to mobile. The adoption from desktop to mobile is outrageous, almost two-thirds today. Data accessibility, teams like Oracle can help with that. Partnerships, as Amy said, with fintechs and other tech companies, and this concept of infrastructure, getting it light, getting it mobile, getting it innovative, getting it agile, and getting it in the cloud. And this is the pressure, like the pressure of diamonds. And here's my example about the chain itself. That diamond ring on your finger, in your ear, on your necklace, it started with a miner, someone who polished it, a wholesaler, someone then manufactured it, shaped it, sent it to the retailer. You're the customer, and now you want to resell it. 
how do you really know that thing is what it is? This could be your wine or your whiskey, right? Going back to the cocktail. Anything you buy that's expensive and you want to know where it came from, is it legitimate? This is the trusted chain that's going to create this transparent way for us to understand and pay and have a ledger that's unbreakable and unique. It is a shared public ledger, so we're all going to be able to see the truth without having to go to some broker or some person who tells us it's the truth. And the chain can't be broken and has to be told. So remember that the coin is really just the opening act. It's really this chain that's going to change the way everything moves and trust and transparency, information, and payments. The investment coming is ginormous. You're going to see some big incumbents investing in a company that was done last night in the financial services world. It's going to shock people. The money that's coming from around the world here and our money in North America heading to Europe and Israel and Asia, South America, Latin America. I ask bankers all the time. I ask entrepreneurs all the time. Where's the fire in your business? Can you smell the smoke? Do you know what room it's coming from and what caused it? Can you tell me where your pain is? Where does it hurt? Where are you having trouble hiring people, needing to hire companies like Oracle? And what time do you wake up in the morning? What do you do when you wake up in the morning? The bankers are pretty cool, right? But the entrepreneurs tell me that they sleep like babies. They get up every two hours and cry. So what I know for sure today that I didn't know a year ago is that businesses are adopting at this machine speed from machine learning, from AI, and from companies like Oracle helping people get the machines in where people were. We don't have time to wait. We have to evolve quicker, faster, because the machines are making us. And FinTech is democratizing credit and making credit inclusive around the world. Most fintech companies and banks are coming from the top down, looking for the richest, wealthiest people to capture everything they have, right? But a lot of companies are coming from the bottom up. We have two billion people on this planet who just got a mobile device. They have no identity, no financial identity. They're not even on the internet 30 days a month. Watch this group as they emerge into the emerging economy and the developing world. There is as much opportunity coming up as there is coming down. And the battle for relevancy and market share is really just begun. If these fintechs can get deposits and get the tech right, it's going to be very hard for the banks and other incumbents, insurance companies and others, to get these people back. They're not coming back. And we see it in payments and banking and security and investing and accounting. It's changing all around the world in this golden era. And the winners, we will all know when we meet a year from now. And this free and premium and freemium thing with gamification is enormous. Giving things away for free, charging some for the premium service, and selling little squares on screens for a dollar each. There are companies with subscription models that will charge you $50 but give you a dollar back if you log in every day, and 50 cents if you click on a square. This is what's capturing these people who are never going back to the old way. Just ask your children. And so what I know for sure is big everything wants a piece of your heart, your mind, and your wallet, and Oracle can help you win in the golden era. Thank you very much.